Don't give up. What a powerful statement. Don't give up. You know, ever read a biography or perhaps even a news article about someone and you've marvelled at the degree of resilience they've had? You know, in the face of incredible odds and personal difficulties and sacrifice, how this person kept going, kept fighting, simply refused to give up. You know, I hear a phrase like, don't give up. And when I first heard this theme, it actually raised for me the recent coverage of the Ukrainian soldiers during the siege of Mariupol for the, you know, eight weeks of being under fire. These soldiers stood firm with many of their comrades wounded, even killed or starving. And they demonstrated a staunch refusal to not surrender, to not give up, but to keep fighting. Put the war and the politics aside. I'm not going there. But look, I, I don't think you can help but be inspired by the courage and the determination of these men and women, these individuals, fighting for a cause that they believed in so strongly that they were willing to endure whatever pain, whatever price, even perhaps the price of their own lives, in order to realise the gain of victory and freedom for their country. More recently, closer to home, we heard last week the testimony of a woman who battled sickness for 12 years. She went from doctor to doctor and pharmacy to pharmacy in search of her cure, but she was a woman who determined to never give up. Until finally, after 12 years, she had the opportunity to reach out and to engage Jesus, the master healing. The gain that this woman was seeking was a strong enough cause to invigorate her, like the Ukrainian soldiers, to endure great pain. If we understand from her perspective the, the physical effort and fatigue, the financial impoverishment of paying and, and, and sort of putting hope in cure after cure, as she crawled out to meet Jesus, the, the risks of being shamed and isolated as she kept seeking and she never gave up on seeking that gain that she was pressing for. I wonder what it is today for you, for each of you. I'm asking even myself in my own heart, is there an expected gain? Is there some vision? Is, is there some cause that I could stand and claim as my own motivation that is strong enough in my life right now, tonight, to be able to follow that same example, that same passion, that same determination to say, I will not give up until I see this realized gain. This isn't an easy message that I have to share today. We as humans, I know we love to hear stories of breakthrough and blessing and reward, but I feel like it is easy, it is tempting to sometimes gloss over the struggles and the hardships and the pain that had to be endured for that person to experience the blessing and to step into the promised gain. We feel this sense of deservedness, perhaps, that if we're going to step out and believe and follow God, then he can and he should take away all the hardship and make, make it, you know, easier for us to follow his way. We'll work for him if we can see and feel him working for us. Let me tell you tonight, church, he is working for us. He is working all things together for good for us who love him and are called according to his purpose. But you know what? It doesn't necessarily mean that he is working all things to be easy or to be comfortable for us. He's not necessarily working a life that is going to be painless for us to follow in his way. In fact, the writer of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 35 and 36, says it this way, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. The truth is we see so many times through the examples, through, through the scriptures, the, the, the fathers of our faith, where God didn't necessarily make their lives easy or painless, but he walked a process of 
pain and hardship with them. And he used that process to position them and to transform them and to shape them into the readiness to receive and to steward wisely and powerfully the gain that he had promised to bring into their lives. We see for Abraham, the father of our faith, he endured years of wandering and barrenness and perhaps even ridicule from his neighbors and surrounding people. From the time he was promised to be a father of many nations, he claimed the name Abraham, a father of many nations, and yet he was fatherless at the time for many years until the birth of his promised son Isaac at a hundred years old. We see with Joseph, he endured years, probably about 20 years of rejection, slavery, imprisonment, and then service in a foreign land without throwing away his confidence that God would make a way to fulfill his promise of raising him to a place of leadership and influence. The children of Israel, even once they had already crossed into the promised land, we see that God still took them through a process of having to step out, having to, to, to step out in faith and, and with, with courage to fight the battles and to claim the cities of the promised land for themselves to actually dwell in, to conquer and inherit that land. We see David, who endured years of belittling from his brothers, humble service to a crazy king Saul, finally being hunted down and forced to live in hardship in the wilderness before he was finally crowned king as God had promised. Elijah, he endured years of persecution, isolation, rejection from even the very same people that he was prophesying to protect and save. A rather painful ministry, actually, before experiencing the promise, the, the breakthrough God had promised of restoring Israel to the worship of God rather than Baal and launching a new generation of prophets who are faithful to God. In the New Testament, we see in our apostles, Peter, Paul, John, they did not lose hope and did not lose confidence that the gospel message would be preached to the nations and believed across the world, enduring much persecution, rejection and hardship. Perhaps we see that in us being here today, they surely, their pain surely yielded a marvelous gain, the promise of God's wing preached and believed. But also, as the writer of Hebrews explains, for them themselves in their lifetime, Hebrews 13, 21 says that this journey is making you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in God's sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. You know, if that's, if that's something that's ever captured your heart, to want to please God, to want to be well-pleasing in his sight, then this is hopefully a message for you that you're going to catch the key that I'm sharing tonight. I don't want to discourage anyone from following God today. I know, you know, you might be hearing all this hardship, all this pain, well, why? Why should we follow God? In fact, we do see, and if you spend time in your, in your scriptures yourself to, to read and to study these people's lives, we see that in each of these testimonies, it's not just a story of hardship, far from it. It is actually a story of incredible protection and provision that God was present and blessing each of these people in every step of their journey. But what I want you to see is that God's blessing and protection didn't necessarily remove them from experiencing some hardship and some pain. And I think that's a mindset that some of us have actually got to confront and realize that the life following God is not necessarily the easy, the comfortable, the complacent life. There is pain. There is hardship. There is a price to pay. But let me tell you tonight from my own experience and from lots of scriptures I'm going to share, it is worth it. There is a gain. There is a reward. There is a blessing that makes every price you pay worth it and more. Amen. The truth is we have a choice. We all have a choice whether to firstly embrace and endure and walk through the pain that will come with following the will of God with the confidence of a certain reward and a guaranteed gain, both in the journey and even more so at its end, or we do have the choice to have a more normal, comfortable, easier existence, the less challenging way. 
Both choices are actually going to bring pain. You can't live in this earth without experiencing some form of hardship, right? Um, but only one of these choices will come with a guarantee of certain, certain reward. And that is the choice to fully embrace, to fully run toward God's will. You know, whether we realize it or not, our choices of how we follow God, even when we read our Bible, how we pray, whether we show up to church or to life group or to Friday worship together, the attitude that we bring with us when we come into these corporate environments, these choices are being shaped by those same forces. The desire to avoid some perceived pain in our life or to achieve a desired gain. In knowing this, it actually equips us, it, it empowers us to leverage this power of motivation. It can help us to embrace and endure whatever challenges and following God might bring, the pain, if you like, in that equation, by helping us to focus on the anticipated gain, the promises of God, the fact that he is so faithful, and yes, and amen, and he will fulfill the blessing and the promise of all he has spoken. The woman with the issue of blood actually leveraged this key. She focused on her gain. She was so focused on the gain, the healing, the source of her blessing that she discounted the pain. Pastor Grace is too elegant to do this, but I'm not. <laughs> she got down on the dusty, dirty ground, being trampled, being kicked, possibly crawling herself, hauling herself through piles of animal dung, not counting the pain as worth stopping her because of the perceived gain. She saw the source of her gain, her healing, Jesus Christ. And that was the motivation. That was the drive that kept her going, never giving up through whatever pain that she had to face and go through to get to the source of her healing. Amen? In fact, we're exhorted. Again, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he says to us, to run the race with endurance that is set before us, taking that same inspiration, taking the inspiration from Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, this, this blows my mind. What, what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2 he said, let this same mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who, you know, Jesus actually didn't need to come to earth. God didn't need to send his son. God is all sufficient. He is, he's, he's got the ability to speak and things are created from nothing. He could, have, he could have just walked away and started again, a fresh universe, a fresh creation. But my God, what Jesus did is he made himself of no account. He came to the dust of the earth and made himself in the form of a servant. He took on the weakness, the likeness of man. And the Bible says, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. He crawled on the earth amongst the judgment, the pride, the egotism, the rejection, the kicking, the trampling, the lashes, the, the nails, the death of humanity around him, and he became obedient to the point of death. He endured pain. You know what the Bible says, how he did that? It was the joy for Jesus, the magnitude of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. I seem to have lost one of the scriptures I had here, but oh no, sorry, it's, it is from Hebrews 12, what I've just read there. The joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. There was pain there in that journey, but it did not weigh in his mind compared to the joy, the gain, the outcome he was pressing for and seeking for. The gain outweighed the pain of the life, the death, and the price that Jesus paid for our redemption. Hallelujah. I think we've got to give God a mighty hand of praise for that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. It's not just God, though. This is a, this is a power for us. The Apostle Paul, you know, another ordinary man, 
empowered and anointed by God with this revelation. He realized that the achievements, the possessions that so often get applauded and lauded as gain and success in this world, that that these things can actually be a source of pain and loss if they hold you back from pursuing the greater gain that God is offering in the life dedicated to following him. He writes in Philippians chapter 3, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. I think there are a lot of Christians, and I humbly count myself in this to some extent, who get held back from really living passionately and wholeheartedly for God because we have a blown up focus on the perceived pain of following God. What's it going to cost me? What am I going to have to give up? How am I going to manage everything else that I'm supposed to do if I'm, if I'm actually passionately, wholeheartedly living for God? We magnify the pain and we don't fully appreciate the magnitude of what we can gain in Christ, the promise and the blessing he's holding out for us in being found in him. We haven't understood what Paul prays for in Ephesians chapter 1, 18 to 19. He's praying, and it's a reality we can receive, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. That is a massive promise, and you will not grasp even a crumb of it until you sit and meditate and wait in the presence of God to ask for that revelation. God, what is this promise gain? The glory of your inheritance in the saints, the exceeding greatness of your power. What is that gain, Lord? We allow ourselves to settle for a level of service and devotion. Enough to say that we've avoided the pain of condemnation and judgment. We've gained a degree of certainty about our future and we're part of something here and now that gives us a sense of purpose and community. And that's, that's great. But if we let ourselves just settle there, we are denying the pain of missed opportunity. The, the opportunity we could have in pressing forward, in allowing ourselves to step into a greater challenge and, and perhaps hardship for the greater gain that God has in store for us. It's echoed again in Paul's words in Philippians 3, if we continue to verses 12 to 14. Paul, this is the Apostle Paul, one of the leaders of the church, says, I do not count myself to have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I don't count myself to have apprehended, But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There is a prize, there is a gain, there is a reward ahead greater than you could ask or fathom or imagine or think. But you, God is calling you. He's not just going to open and pour it in your lap. There is a process, there is a journey to press in to pursue, to lay hold of that. Christ has already given it to you. It's yours and mine to press in so we can lay hold of that. Amen. Now, I want to make this as practical as I can for us tonight. And I'm going to take the time remaining to deep dive into two of the statements that were recently shared about our church culture. This is the gain. This is the vision. This is what God has put on our hearts to want to be pressing forward for to, to experience part of that blessing he has for us. Now, we, we do have a special guest in the house, so I'm going to see if um, we can actually ask him for some of his wisdom and some of his insight on these things as we talk. So just be ready for a little bit of an interview. The first culture I want to share is that of giving. Why don't we just turn our eyes to the screen and let's all read together the culture of giving. We give extravagantly. Because giving is every believer's lifestyle. I can't hear you. Come on. As a result, we live within the blessing and favor of God. I am captured in that statement by the word lifestyle. 
I'm a lifestyle physician. And to me, the word lifestyle, it implies something that we do consistently and habitually. It's not because someone else has told us to do it or we're marking it off a to-do list, but because we ourselves have a revelation on the inside that this is what we want to do and this behaviour flows out of a sense of who we are. We can be motivated to make giving our lifestyle because God himself modelled a lifestyle of giving. Lord, I love your character. I love your identity as an extravagant giver. You reveal it to us in so many scriptures. I did not spare my own son, but delivered him up for you all. How shall I not with him also freely give you all things? For I am a son and a shield. I will give grace and glory. No good thing will I withhold from those who walk uprightly. How great is the goodness I have stored up for those who fear me. I lavish it on those who come to me for protection, blessing them before the watching world. Wow, how awesome is our God. Those blessings, that is taken directly from Scripture. Please keep your eye on the screen. The references will come up there. But it was Romans 8, 32, Psalm, 8, Psalm 84, 11 to 12, and Psalm 31, 19. It's so true that we love because he first loved us. We give because everything we have comes from him. Nothing we have is really ours, but it's given to us by him. It's given in trust to use in a way that honors and glorifies him. These promises, they're just a small glimpse of the goodness of God, of the blessing, of the promise gain. He said, I'm, I'm freely giving you all things. There's no good thing withheld. There's goodness that's lavished on those who walk uprightly, who fear God and who come to him. God, I have a question. I know there are people in this room who are struggling with their finances. I could share testimonies of people who are scrambling to work as many shifts as they can right now. They're pouring money into rent and food and visa and school expenses and they're not experiencing this kind of blessing you just shared. Can, can you explain that? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have you robbed me? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with the curse, for you have robbed me. Whoa. Even this whole nation. That's pretty intense, Lord, that you would call someone cursed and a robber. Please go on. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Can I, I'm just going to stop a moment there and clarify the tithe. The tithe literally means 10%. We see examples in scripture of, again, the fathers of our faith who understood the principle of tithe and brought. Abraham, he gave one-tenth of the spoils he won in battle. Jacob, after wrestling with the angel of God, he pledged, of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you in Genesis 28. When God himself gave Moses the detailed words of law for how we honour him with our lives, God said, all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed, of the fruit, of the livestock, it is the Lord's, it is holy to the Lord. Um, Leviticus 27, there was verse 30, but there's many verses in that section if you want to go and look in Leviticus 27, a bit of research for yourself. For us in the New Testament church, Jesus, in his earthly ministry, spoke of the ongoing importance of tithing. To bring that first 10% of our income to the temple, now the church, when he rebuked the Pharisees about their legalism, in Matthew 23, 23, he essentially states, you ought to have tithed without neglecting the other values in the law like justice and mercy and faithfulness. Let me say up front, I have no personal interest in this. As most of you, I am a volunteer. I receive no remuneration, no money, no payment for my time. I give to the church. I simply recognize that God's house is such a place of blessing, such a source of life and joy to me and to my family that I delight in being able to support the ministry of this house. There are many ways that we can bring our tithe to church. You, you can give in cash as the offering basket passes on a Sunday, or there are opportunities to do a direct, debit, uh, direct bank transfer or pay by card, and those details are freely available. Um, in a practical sense... 
some of you may not know, but the tithes are used for the ministry of the church. They're used in a really practical way to meet all sorts of needs. The salary of our staff, our pastors are on a salary. They don't take a commission or sort of build up bonuses for themselves. That is all audited um, and, and it is all above board. Tithes are used to cover vehicle and equipment costs. The hall rental, the fact that we can be here and sit in a place like this today. The cost of ingredients for our catering, for our care packages, for mandatory insurances, etc. Let me be up front and say that God does not need your money. God does not need your tithe. This is the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. If you don't bring your money, trust me, God has another way of providing the needs, the financial needs of this church to stay in operation and to stay as a beacon of hope and a house that will glorify him. Amen? But what your tithe will do is there's actually a spiritual component to bringing your tithe. You see, man receives the money, but when you bring your tithe, God receives the heart. In a spiritual sense, your tithes demonstrate to God the genuineness of your faith in him, the gratitude that indeed everything we have comes from God and that we are willing to trust him with it all. God, this is going to feel a little bit painful to some of the people here because, as I said, I know there are people here who are already feeling stretched and you're asking them to take their first 10% and to give it to the church? Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fall, fail to bear fruit for you in the field. And all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land. Ah, amen. Here is the promised reward. Here is the gain that God promises to all who fear him and follow his ways. Bringing God our tithe, that first 10%, both positions us to receive his blessing, the open windows of heaven, and also activates his protection over the remaining 90%. So the 90% will be more productive and fruitful. This is what is actually meant by calling those who neglect the tithe as being cursed. It's the absence of God's protection and favor over their possessions. This is one of those areas that requires a perspective shift. It's not natural to just give without expectation of some return. Rather than calculating all the other things that you could spend that 10% tithe on yourself and feeling pained that God has asked you to give it to him, it helps to shift the perspective and recognize the pain that you can avoid by trusting God to give that 10% activating your faith to believe for his promised blessing. Blessing can come in all shapes and sizes. There are countless testimonies. I'm sure many people in this church, many people across our branches in Indonesia and Malaysia, the testimonies of blessing in my own life as someone who has consistently tithed since my very first job. You know, I remember as a teenager earning $7.50 a week for teaching piano to my neighbor's kid. Right through the financial challenges of a long and expensive uni degree, purchasing a home at the same time as marrying Rod 14 years ago, raising two children, putting two children through daycare. That is not cheap, believe me. But tithing to God is our first financial priority and we have consistently, praise God, seen protection and blessing over our finances. The protection comes in ways like appliances that just keep going and keep going well beyond their expected lifespan. Um, Our car runs as well now as the day when we bought it nine years ago. No accidents, no parking fines, no speeding tickets. We don't have any medical expenses. In two and a half years of a pandemic as a doctor face to face with sick people, I have not had a single sick day where I've had to call off work unexpectedly. That is praise to God. And that is protection, because if I don't work, I don't get paid. Protection on my finances. We have seen blessing in ways like sudden gifts and blessings from friends, from the workplace, even from strangers. The bonus that that gets calculated on, on sort of Rod's income in a 
corporate setting year on year, we are amazed and in awe at what God blesses Rod in, in the workplace bonus system. Items that we need to purchase just suddenly get massive discounts, sudden, you know, sales. My latest phone, which, by the way, is a really nice new generation, more than $1,000, um, I paid zero. I paid zero dollars on that phone because basically at the time I wanted it, it got discounted, I think, about 30 40% sale. And in that same moment, suddenly I was able to redeem some points on the balance. So I paid zero. And not only that, but God orchestrated it. So it arrived almost the same day as the camera on my old phone, which was about five years old. The camera died on the same day as I needed and received the blessing of a new phone. Hallelujah, God is good. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm going to share humbly that I've also experienced the pain of losing God's protection when I've robbed God and delayed the tithe. This is, this is a real thing. God is really interested in our heart and the attitude that we give with. It's not just about the amount. It's not just setting an auto transfer or tithe, tithe. It's habit. It's routine. This is something that's actually happened for me recently is I've gotten, I've, I've been really busy and distracted with other things and I'd somehow had a few times this year where I'd forgotten to transfer my tithe for up to a few weeks. Just this week, I had a situation with my credit card. There was an error that I made on my end, and I have been slugged with a decent bank fee. It's relatively a small charge, thanks Lord, but as I searched my own heart about it, there was just this whisper, this revelation in my heart to realise this is a reminder for me of how powerfully God defends his word, how true the principles in his word are. All the places that money can trickle away if he doesn't rebuke the devourer on our behalf. The trickle of sickness, medical fees, a fine here, a repair bill there, having to pay full price to replace something urgently, it's trickle, it's trickle. The costs go up, the rent goes up, the, this fails, trickle, trickle. The devourer is in your fields. Please don't take this to interpret that, you know, don't interpret this to mean that anybody paying these kind of expenses must not be tithing. No, this is not about judgment or condemnation. It is not for me or for anyone to judge another person. But I really want to encourage you to take this moment to self-reflect on your own financial circumstances between your own heart and God tonight, just to ask to have sensitivity and to recognise whether you may have an element of financial pain because there's a devourer loose in your fields and you've not had the full protection and blessing that God promises to the tither. Because here, in the tithe, that first 10% of all your income given promptly and willingly, here is the secret of bringing God into whatever financial pain or limitation you are facing and seeing him turn it into a gain. Amen? Now, in that culture statement, we give extravagantly because uh, giving is every believer's lifestyle. There, there is also that word extravagantly. Luar biasa. Literally, it means unreasonable, excessive, outrageous, beyond what seems appropriate. Now, regarding our finances or any material goods, when it boils down, we, we really have three choices of what we're going to do with it, right? We can save it. We can put it aside for a rainy day or for a future need. We can spend it, enjoy it, eat it up, use it for something we need or we want right now. Or we can sow it, give it as a blessing to someone else. That's really, at the end of it, the three choices, to save, to spend, or to sow. And, you know, we are typically, we're going to use that same framework to decide what do we do with the 90% that remains after we tithe, what will give us the least amount of pain, the most amount of gain, either immediate or short term, or, or some of us may be able to think more longer term. God, can, can you help us to get your perspective on this pain versus gain equation in giving extravagantly? Well, remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. 
and God will generously provide all you need, then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Awesome. Awesome. This scripture reminds me of the testimony of Isaac. Here was a man in Genesis, a man of a lot of responsibility, many servants and livestock, many mouths to feed, and he was caught in a time of famine. The prevailing attitude when you're in a time of famine is to store your seed away, to save it until the weather changes and you're more likely to get a crop. I think some of us might feel this way right now. We are caught in a time of rising living costs, inflation, stagnant wages, and let's face it, there's a human instinct to kind of bunker down, to save what you can, and to save until a better opportunity presents. Sowing might not even come into consideration. And yet, in obedience to God, Genesis 26, 12 says, Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. God wants to open our eyes to the reality of his blessing. It is, it is beyond understanding. It is totally out of this world's comprehension, beyond logic, more than you could imagine or think. But the blessing is found in doing things his way. It's not the way of the world. It's not the way of the media commentators or the financial analysts or the way that you've inherited from your parents or the way that you've built over time with your thoughts and your logic and your prior experiences. If we can capture the wisdom of these words that God has just so beautifully shared with us from 2 Corinthians, it says in verse 6, a farmer who plants. You know, a farmer is someone who sows into a chosen field. There is intentionality in sowing. And so if we're talking about giving extravagantly, I'm not talking about just haphazardly, oh, here or there. There is an intentionality in bringing your seed to God and saying, whether this is to the church, to a specific project, to a charity, maybe it's a seed you sow to a specific person in need or just as a gift, as a blessing. It is intentional that you say, God, I'm sowing this into this person's life for their blessing. In verse 7, um, it says, you must each decide in your heart. It is, it is a conscious choice, a decision to prayerfully and sensitively decide, not just by habit or routine, Please don't sow just because I have told you tonight. Don't sow based on my faith or the faith of your leader. This is a decision of your own heart. Take time to understand for yourself. Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 is a wonderful chapter to sit and read and meditate and understand. God, teach me, teach my heart. Help me decide in my heart what does this mean for my life. And verse 7 also says, giving cheerfully, not grudging with a sense of pain in what you are personally sacrificing or missing out by sowing, but with thankfulness and with expectation that God is going to resource you so that there's not only enough for yourself, but there's also an overflow for you to be a vessel in blessing others and in seeing others' pain transformed into a promise fulfilled. God, you, you said a bit more about the sowing. Tell us more. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, I will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when you take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. There's a powerful momentum in this statement. See, if you're sitting there and you're one of those, I might have said, who was just getting by or struggling a little bit, begging you to go and drain out your bank account and give the whole amount and just give. <laughs> there is a wisdom here. But, but God's saying, what's the seed? What is the seed you do have in your hand? And it might be like the little boy with his five loaves and two fish. That's not enough to feed 5,000 men, for sure. But that's what he had. That was his seed. And God says, bring your seed, sow it. And when you choose to be a sower and you give the seed you have, God provides seed to the sower so that there is a multiplied harvest of more seed for you than to choose. Do I save? 
do I spend, do I sow? But if you choose, the, every time you step out and choose, I'm going to be a sower, I'm going to sow, I'm going to sow, I'm going to sow. God is faithful and he promises, I supply seed to the sower. You're going to be enriched in every way so you can always be generous and it's going to produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Amen. Again, I could stand here all day and just share so many testimonies from this church. But just one that, you know, hopefully inspires you. There is a couple here, they're in our midst tonight, who, you know, like all of us, they've been through a pretty stretching time, less work hours, increased expenses. But this couple, I've seen them faithfully continuing to dedicate their Sunday to serving God, not taking extra shifts when they could have earned more money, um, but serving God, giving their tithe, sowing over and above according to what they were able and willing. And fairly recently, unexpectedly, both people in this couple were were given extravagant pay rises. One got 10%, the other got 25% pay rise increase for exactly the same role. That deserves a praise to God. And this is, this is not isolated to just some people. This is God's promise to anyone who takes him at his word. From giving extravagantly to receiving the blessing and favor of God, which is then equipping them to continue giving extravagantly and enjoying living in the blessing and favor for themselves. So to bring this culture home, when it comes to our finances, we, we have a choice. We can look at what giving to God tithing and sowing may cost us and we can decide that is too great a risk. It's more pain than we are willing to risk compared to the familiar pain of working hard and earning our income and spending or saving it as we can. Or we can take the risk of believing God's word and the gain that he promises to the generous and cheerful giver. We can choose to walk through the personal sacrifice of maybe giving up something that you yourself wanted or would otherwise get to be part of supporting and blessing the church and its people. But with the expectation that as you do this, God will steadily increase the harvest back to you to provide and increase your resources and enrich you in every way to resource the lifestyle of giving extravagantly. I want to just quickly spend a little bit of time on one other culture, which is the ministry culture. And if we bring that statement up again, let's read this one out together again. Ministry. We build God's house. We serve one another. We assist wherever needed with initiative and a sense of ownership. We are passionate about seeing God's kingdom come. You know, God, just as with our money, I know there's so many competing demands on our time between our work, study, homework, housework, laundry, groceries, cooking, sleeping. I mean, we're not all called to be pastors. Why should we be involved in ministry and building God's house? What does that even mean? Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your panelled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. It's a very similar story to what you're asking with our finances, isn't it, God? If we, sorry, you promise that if we align our priorities with your priorities to invest our time and our talents in building your kingdom and your house, that you will protect and bless our house and households. If we don't have blessing on our household, then your word describes all sorts of painful consequences like the lack of productivity or going around in circles, the same problems over and over, trying to change but not really changing, always unsatisfied. Maybe on the surface, looking like we can eat, drink, be clothed and earn wages, but actually on the inside, struggling to get any sense of momentum, any sense of 
blessing and breakthrough in those things. It's like Psalm 127 says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Let's just be clear. It's not that God is making these struggles happen. It's simply the state of the world when you are living without the protection and the favor of God, it's entropy. There's going to be chaos. There's going to be challenges. I have had to personally deliberately consider this question of my priorities in recent times. My schedule shifted this year as my youngest daughter started kindergarten, and it seemed like I had some more time available. I've had to ask myself, do I prioritize God's house and initiate to to commit more time and effort towards ministry? Some of the areas that I know God has blessed and gifted me to support, like the praise and worship team, teaching and preaching, and the next gen children's ministry? Or do I prioritize some of the, you know, let's be honest, bit neglected areas in my own household, like decluttering and some of the heavier maintenance tasks? self-care like my own sleep and exercise or even perhaps increasing my own work hours and being able to earn some more money. Look, it's still a work in progress but I want to declare that I have taken this culture of ministry to heart. I build God's house. I serve one another. I assist wherever needed with initiative and a sense of ownership. You know, we can pretty much take it to the bank that when we prioritize to look after God's house, He will help look after ours. It's like Matthew 6.33. When you seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. We are passionate about seeing God's kingdom come. There may well be a level of perceived pain in choosing to serve in God's house, whether it's the extra few hours on a Sunday morning to be involved in supporting catering and inventory setting up teams, getting out in the rain, maybe even just packing that bus with pouring torrential rain, maybe changing your closing shift on a Tuesday night to an opening so you can finish earlier and can be involved to help prepare a meal before your life group. Maybe the pain might be simply getting out of your comfort zone to go and Stretch yourself to greet someone and make a connection with someone that you've been too shy or too lazy to approach before. I know I've had a certain price to pay in choosing to prioritize ministry. (laughs) This week, particularly, less sleep, preparing a message, (laughs) stepping out of my comfort zone. I don't love being here on the platform. But um, coming around our pastors, I've paid the price of of having, having my thoughts, having my pride confronted and rebuked. But no matter how uncomfortable this position gets, I have already decided I won't give up. Because the gain, the productivity, the blessing that I'm experiencing goes well beyond the ministry. Despite committing my time to church, I'm going to say God's brought gain in those household things of my own I was hoping for. I've been able to complete quite a bit of the declutter. I've had access to some amazing, fruitful, career-advancing education opportunities. And praise God, I'm routinely earning about 10% more than I was this time last year. That is God looking after my house as I've committed to look after His. Amen? So... When you and your house determine to serve the Lord, to give a priority to building his house, this is the return on investment that God promises you. Yet now be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. The glory of this latter-day temper temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah. We want your peace, Lord. You might not know where to start tonight, but if you were willing, let me assure you there is a place here for you in ministry. There is an opportunity for you to serve and to be part of building God's house In fact, let's just take a moment to honour those who are already serving, who have been part of bringing this together tonight. Um, Wherever you are, anybody in inventory team, decorations, media, sound and lighting teams, the musicians and and singers, a next-gen kids ministry team, catering team, the set-up and pack-down, ushers, our life group leaders and assistants, we 
together, build God's house. We serve one another. We assist wherever needed with initiative and a sense of ownership. We are passionate about seeing God's kingdom come. Amen. (laughs) Hallelujah. I'm going to leave you tonight with this thought. Living on this earth, no matter who you are or what choices you make, it is going to involve some level of hardship, hard work and possibly pain. But as they say, no pain, no gain. (laughs) It is often through the pain, the pain of God's way, that you are positioned and prepared to gain something that you could not otherwise gain. You have the ability to choose. Will you tolerate and choose the pain of trying to solve your problems and challenges in your own way? The pain that will potentially just evolve from one problem to another problem? Or are you bold? Are you willing? Are you confident enough to choose tonight the pain of growth, the growing pains, the self-denying pains, the pain of paying a price and dying to yourself in some way, sacrificing something of your time, of your personal comfort, sacrificing your old habits and your mindsets. It's the type of pain that, you know, it might have us down on our knees, down in an uncomfortable place. It's choosing, not necessarily being forced into that place, but choosing to embrace and engage with the pain because we have a vision, we have a view, we have an expectation of Christ. We are pursuing to lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of us. And there is a gain that makes all of that pain and hardship so worthwhile. Tonight, I want you to see the promise. I want you to see the amazing blessing that there is a huge gain for you and for the body of Christ in your choice to follow Him wholeheartedly. My prayer tonight, my hope is that you are going to catch that blessing, that it's a strong enough motivation to shift you from whatever comfort or complacency or, or fear or doubt or just going around in circles, whatever it is, to shift you into the willingness to endure the pain for the joy that is set before you, to never give up on pursuing God and pressing toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. God will never owe whatever you give in serving Him. He will never owe. He will always repay and reward and with interest, with multiplication, with blessing. We serve such a good God.